you physically here or all of you that join us in community from wherever you are. Thank you to Lynette for that wonderful introduction and my thanks also to the organizations here in the Hershey area that put this together. I think it is fantastic and I think that you as Hershey should be a proud model for the way that a lot of places, not just in Pennsylvania, but all over our country and world can be demonstrating how we can come together and talk about diverse topics and learn from one another because isn't that what it's all about? So as you heard, uh, I currently work at the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Uh, prior to that, I uh, was asked by our governor, Tom Wolf, uh, to create and lead the nation's first statewide organization for LGBTQ affairs through state government. Um, so, yes, shout out to the Wolf administration in Pennsylvania. We may not always be known as the trailblazer first <laughs> of the way states are doing it, but this one, we finally got one right. And so it was an amazing opportunity and also a little bit of a terrifying opportunity. Uh, you know, many of us come into a role or we get promoted at work and the first thing that we do is like, well, how did the person before me do it? And what can I just copy that went really well? And so I literally came into something that no one had done before. Uh, and so it was a, an amazing year and a half building infrastructure and helping an entire state sort of look at how are we engaging? How are we educating? Uh, and how are we valuing the lives of LGBTQ Pennsylvanians? Which is what we're gonna talk about for about the next hour here. Please excuse me if I look at my phone. This could easily become a four hour presentation, but I am between you and dessert. So I'm gonna make sure it doesn't become a four hour presentation as we jump right in. So why are we here? Um, and how do I hope that this presentation will connect to hopefully a, a number of others that you've been able to come to on these uh, topics of diversity. So I would tell you that one of the reasons we're here is because whatever organization, or if we're just an, an, an individual who has a, a understanding or an interest in this topic, we share messages through our culture. So each one of those organizations that help sponsor this today have culture as part of their organization. If you are here, I know we have uh, the Hershey Rotary Group and other perhaps groups, organizations with us. I promise you there is a culture that goes along with your organization. And sometimes we really get it right where the things that we value and our organizational culture kind of mirror one another. And sometimes we end up in spaces where we say, well, we value these things and these things are important to us but someone interfaces with our workplace, with our organization and says, I'm not really seeing that. I might be hearing it, but I'm not feeling that when I engage with you. And so one of the reasons we look at why diversity is important, because we wanna make sure that that organizational culture is welcoming to everybody. I will also, you'll hear me throughout this presentation talk about the intersectionality of identity. Uh, if, if you've heard that word, this is a really big thing in diversity research right now. And so essentially, I can't come up and say to you, we're going to only speak about someone's LGBTQ identity without saying, what are all those other identities that we all hold that come into play equally around LGBTQ status? So we can't talk about what's happening to LGBTQ Pennsylvanians without thinking about what does that mean in racial justice lenses? What does that mean in ableism, right? Our level of ability. What does that mean in socioeconomic standing? So that I cannot come up here and say, here's what's happening. Here's the LGBTQ experience in Pennsylvania. And the reason I can't do that is because all of those other identities that we all hold all come into play and all build on top of one another. So we, we want to make sure we value that. That's why I love that the name of this series is All Things Diversity. We're not looking just at one, we're looking holistically at it. And then the third one, I would guarantee you that a lot of folks here in Hershey are committed somehow to the user experience, right? Whether it's healthcare, whether it's entertainment, whether it's tourism, whether it's education, in all of the veins that may have brought us here, we have some sort of input output with a user. 
And again, we want to ensure that everybody who is coming here in Hershey, whether they are a resident, whether they are a visitor, whether they are here for anything, is having an experience where they are saying, wow, that was fantastic. I love Hershey. I would love to invest or come back again. So I like to put it out there. Uh, sometimes, now I know you are here all on your own accord, so I'm probably not speaking to you, but I often go into a lot of corporate trainings where, you know, somebody got the email that said, hey folks, it's every six months diversity talk that's coming tomorrow morning. And everyone's like, oh, okay, great, we have to go back to the diversity talk. And why is it that these are challenging topics sometimes? I like to just call it out. Like, let's talk about why some people get really nervous around the diversity talks. And for some, they're gonna say, oh, it's just that same thing over and over again. I have heard this topic so many times. And maybe you are here and you said, I have, I've listened to lectures, I've, I've listened to TED Talks, I've read books, like I know a lot of stuff about LGBTQ identities. Great. Um, and hopefully you may learn something new. I will tell you, uh, you know, doing this over a number of years, I tweak and reframe and revalue something because this is an ever growing spectrum of understanding. And something that you may have heard a year ago, there might be a new term, there might be a better way of understanding it. So uh, I promise you, hopefully you'll still have a takeaway from tonight. To some, they might say, I, the diversity talks are really hard for me because it, it's whatever the facilitator thinks and that's the only way of thinking, right? So if you don't agree with Todd, you better just get out. I promise that's not the case. Don't get out. Day. Um, let's talk about it. Uh, I understand we, we bring a lot of different perspectives to how we understand things, and I think sometimes when we actually have those dialogues, it's how we strengthen those understandings. <clears throat> Diversity can be challenging for some people because they see it through a lens of, if you're gonna, you're gonna use words like majority, or you're gonna use words like privilege, and those to some people are fire starters because they say, you tell me I have privilege, do you know how hard it is for me? Or you want me to feel guilty about myself? I promise you it is neither one of those things. So we are not asking you to feel guilty about yourself. So sometimes I give these and people will come up to me afterwards and be like, I'm so sorry that I'm cisgender, Todd. I hold a lot of privilege and I feel really guilty about that. Do not feel guilty about who you are but recognize that sometimes who you are gives you a social standing that others don't get. So it is an acknowledgement, it's not about guilt. Also, no, not one of us has never gone through adversity, right? We have challenging days. We are living in challenging days right now. And so when we look at issues of diversity, it is not saying that we all have not fought tremendously hard and overcome things. But again, we can acknowledge the systems that come into play where we are a majority identity and therefore may hold more social power than others. And by acknowledging that and by understanding it and helping to unravel it, it's how we help to even out the scales. And lastly, some say, ooh, the diversity talk. It's about people wanting me to change my mind or change how I live with my family or change what I value. And I guarantee you it is none of those things. Again, it is not about changing anything about you. It is helping us all to be aware that while we value something, it may be very different for the person that we're interacting with. And how can we come together to better understand those things? So I thought, you know what? I mean, I, I grew up, I've lived near Hershey, PA for so long. I thought, if I just Google Hershey, PA, right, and look at what a visitor might look at, what are they going to see? And so I did this, I found some quick websites, and I pulled this, right, from one of our tourism websites that says, Hershey, PA, plan a getaway for your family to Hershey and experience everything from thriller, thrilling coaster rides and chocolate adventures to premier dining and luxurious spa treatment. You'll leave with sweet chocolate-filled memories that can only be made in Hershey, the sweetest place on earth. 
And there's that little, you know, it's like, don't steal that, we'll sue you if you steal that. <laughs> that right? So, nice try. We're the only one who gets to see the Swedish place on So I thought about this. And I thought, you know, I grew up near Hershey, but I've done pretty much everything on that list. And so I thought, okay, great. We are saying that whoever you are, you and your family are welcome here in Hershey to interface on all of those things. Now, please hear me that I am not here because Hershey is not doing well with this, right? I'm not here to come and say I have, I have done a huge you know, account of Hershey and here's all the things you're doing wrong. That is not why I'm here. I know that a lot of our entities here in Hershey are thinking very intentionally around these ideas about diversity. However, here would be my challenge that we could all think about. Does everyone who meets the definition of family have the same equitable and have the same welcoming opportunity to do all of those things. So if I'm going to, if I wanna bring my family to Hershey Park, no matter what my family looks like, how that family interacts, is it gonna be the same experience? If I want to go dining in Hershey, do I know that if I'm celebrating an anniversary that I'm going to have an amazing experience with the person that I'm celebrating that anniversary with, regardless of that person's gender identity and mine? Do I know if I go to the Hershey Spa, is there going to be any problem with the facilities I use? What robe color am I going to wear? So for those of us who maybe have gone to the spa, I'm guilty of that, I will just tell you. Um, there is some gendered things going on at the spa, even down to the types of clothing that we wear there. Is anyone welcome to wear a certain color robe or use a certain facility if that matches who they are? I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying when we market something and we say everyone is welcome here and everyone can engage in all of these activities, are we living up to our end of the bargain? So where we sometimes fall short is in the ways that we have been socialized. And so oftentimes, we did not get a manual, we did not have a textbook that told us how we're supposed to think around so many things in the world. We learn by observation. We learn by social behavior. We see how groups of, of people understand the world and we start to understand through those experiences. And so, in order to understand where do some of our ideas come from, we are going to start to look at some ideas that are listed here, and we're gonna break these down item by item to see what we're actually talking about. So what is homophobia and or transphobia? In each one of the items that we're going to look at, you're gonna see that slash, right? So the first one, homophobia, deals with sexual orientation, the second one, transphobia, deals with gender identity. So you'll always see a double, right? One that sort of is a word that uh, aligns with sexual orientation, one that aligns with gender identity. So homophobia or transphobia is when someone shows an irrational fear, aversion, discomfort, and or dislike for LGBTQ people. We know that when these ideas pervasively creep into groups of people, this can then lead to things like discrimination, violence, and victimization. In all of these situations, sometimes these ideas are very overt, meaning there's really no way of hiding them, and sometimes they can creep into culture in other ways that are not so overt. Let's look at some of those examples. So on the left, I'm pretty sure we could not argue that that is pretty overt homo and transphobia, right? So we, we know that there are groups and, and we know that it is, uh, it is a human right to be able to protest. Um, I'm not gonna read what those say because you can hopefully see what those images say, but really, really overt kind of hateful speech that we know some people will use. But like I said, not all homophobia and transphobia is that overt. Look on the right. So if you are aware, um, 
Uh, a new way of kind of expressing humor is through something that is now called a meme. So social media is full of memes. It is this way in which society, mostly in Western culture now, understands humor. I am a sociologist by trade. We could spend a whole hour looking at what we actually learn from humor, because I would tell you there are a lot of lessons subliminally in humor. But in this specific meme, you're going to see two boxes. On the top, what someone has articulated as what boys did in my day, and we'll sort of see these very heightened masculine images of young boys with guns, military hats, these sort of things. And then in the bottom, what boys are doing today. And assumingly, we are seeing, or we would infer that we are seeing young men who are being more fluid and expressive in their gender identities. And so this is meant to serve in this way of, oh look, we find humor in that. But again, there is a lesson there, right? We are becoming socialized to say what's on top is the right, it is the correct, it is the appropriate way to behave as a young man, and what's on the bottom are things outside of that. Heterosexism and cisgenderism is a belief system that basically says we are trained to examine the world by every single person we meet, assuming that they are heterosexual and that they are cisgender. And I promise you that if any of those words you're saying, boy, I've heard people use them, but I'm the, I'm the one that's not sure if I know all those definitions, I promise you we'll break all of them down. But essentially, heterosexism and cisgenderism means everybody we meet, we're going to assume they are hetero and they are cis, until we are told otherwise. It also means that we essentially believe that in order for everyone to succeed in the world, they are going to essentially have to adapt. Meaning that if you are non-heterosexual, you're going to have to be assumed heterosexual to be successful in the world. If you are transgender, you are going to have to be assumed to be cisgender to be successful in the world. And we know that these types of ideas don't just eke into the personal psyche, they can eke into our systems and our organization. Things like religious, cultural, institutional settings. They can become pervasive in those. Let's look at some examples. Does anybody know the name Gus Kentworthy? Does that sound familiar? Hey, some hands went up. Okay, you're alive. You're still with me. So Gus Kentworthy is an Olympic snowboarder. American, uh, was in the Winter Olympics, medaled in the Winter Olympics. So who believes that that's newsworthy? I love following the Olympics. I love to know when Americans medal. Here's the fascinating thing. Uh, this is literally, I pulled this from a news source. This was a breaking news article that says nothing about Gus Kentworthy actually winning a medal. Do you know what it says? Well, you, you do, because it's right there. Olympian Gus Kentworthy kisses his boyfriend at the Olympics live on TV. That was the breaking news headline. And I love the smaller headline in italics, and they showed a rainbow pride flag, as if that's like shocking, right? So, <laughs> What I would say, right, to argue, somebody might say, well, yeah, this is newsworthy. I mean, he did it on TV. Well, let's think about that. So someone may, have, may say, well, the newsworthy part is the shock value of a athlete kissing their partner on TV. I saw pundits to this saying, that's inappropriate. We should be throwing that in people's faces. Why would an athlete ever make this choice? So if we think about that argument, what I would say is, I've never once seen any of these images flash across CNN, Fox, or MSNBC saying, this just in. Football star kisses pretty blonde blatantly on live TV and throws it in our face, disgusting. We look at this happening probably almost every weekend on our TV if we turn on an athletic competition. We don't blink an eyelash to this, but the minute it looked like this, 
all of a sudden it was newsworthy. So what is that saying? It's saying, oh, well, this shouldn't be in our face because there's something wrong with this, right? Now that's not said anywhere in this article, but that is absolutely the messaging that is coming along. If we think about cisgenderism, right? We think about, if you've ever noticed, we gauge a lot of things in marketing towards specific groups. So for instance, I may go to a mall, even though they're about becoming extinct, but I still like malls, and some stores are going to tell me who specifically should be going in there. We also, um, if, you can, if you can't see at the top, because I know it's a little bit small, um, the, the first image up at the top says women's wear as the headline. So my question is, are we welcoming anyone who identifies in any of those spaces to go in there? And are those titles being inclusive enough? If I want to go into Express because I want a fitted tuxedo, that's wonderful. Why is it that only one determination of gender is allowed to wear that? So all of the ways that messaging says what is appropriate, what is right, and what is not. So again, please know, I am not being critical of Hershey, but for instance, as I was searching Google, I found this image, and I, I apologize, I know it's a little pixelated. So if Hershey's only marketing for tourism was families welcome here, and this is the image, is, that, is there anything wrong with that family? No, they're beautiful. I love beautiful people. I'm all about beautiful people. They got beautiful children. Everybody's taking a selfie. What's a potential flaw? Who's missing? Call it out. There's many answers. Okay, so we would presume everybody up here is white. So essentially, if we're saying your family is welcome here, what we've shown in images is here's who's welcome here. What else is missing? Okay, so different aged families, absolutely. People with disabilities. Right, so we would assume everybody there is able-bodied. They all seem to be standing on their own accord. Well, except for our, our youngest who's being held, but yes. So different levels of ability. What else? So we would assume everybody there is heterosexual and cisgender. We have a lot of definitions of families. They're not always what we would assume to be two parent. We don't have any guardians or grandparents or aunts and uncles, assumingly, right? So again, I'm not being critical of Hershey. This is a wonderful marketing strategy. But again, think back to that culture piece. If we're saying family is welcome here, the, the internal message we're getting if images always look like this is as long as you look like this, Families are welcome here. And if you don't, oh no, are you welcome here? Are you not? And finally, heteronormativity and cis normativity. So a norming phenomenon where, again, being heterosexual and being cisgender is just woven into the fabric of culture. How do we see things like this play out? So on the left, family-friendly parking symbols. And so nothing wrong with this family, but what this says is, okay, so families, there's gonna be somebody in pants and somebody in a dress and their, their nice child and their nice little pram there and they're a very happy family. We know that not all families look like that. On the right, again, oh, I'm a sociologist. We, we, could, we could be here for an hour. Uh, couples costume. So we see a lot of, again, I'll probably date myself, but circulars in our newspapers, we don't think a lot of them. Uh, you know, we, we are marketed to as young as some sociologists would tell you, six months old, right? Marketing starts in how we look at, uh, how we entice people into things. So every time we listen to an ad, read an ad, look at something in a magazine, see something flash on television. We may not think about it, but it's sharing a message. So one message in this is that couples are always heterosexual, presumably, 
But you know, there are other messages. Like if we look at the very bottom, like who gets to be the doctor and who's the sexy nurse, right? So lots of messages of how we see the world. So, in order, so you may say, well, Todd, I, this is how I've grown up. This is how I've always thought about the world. How am I about to understand how to think about it now? So I would tell you that as we enter this part of the presentation, it is a co-presentation. I would like to now introduce you to my co-pilot through all of this, the gender unicorn. <laughs> we don't hug, we will we'll elbow the gender unicorn to stay healthy. Uh, so the gender unicorn I love for a couple of reasons. You'll see up in the corner the organization that put out this piece of literature, but one of the reasons I use it is because TSER brought a whole bunch of youth who were gender expansive and trans and LGBTQ and said, sit in the room, and if you were trying to explain this to your loved ones, parents, caregivers, how would you do it? So I love that our own community has come up with this as a way to help demonstrate it. So you will notice on the gender unicorn that we have a lot of different grids. And we're gonna talk about each of those grids and what it means. And we're gonna start smack dab in the middle of those five grids at something called sex assigned at birth. If you happen to be able to see finite on the gender unicorn, you will also see that in the grid that we talk about, there will be a little symbol that then equates to where on the body we are referring to on the gender unicorn. So sex assigned at birth essentially means two things. It means our anatomy, it means the physical body parts in which we have, and it means our physiology, our DNA molecules. In DNA, there is something XX, and there is something X, Y. And this is essentially how we are knowledgeable between that DNA and between our body, how we come to understand what it means to be biologically female and biologically male. Most of us probably are very comfortable with both of those labels. But that is not an exhaustive and inclusive list. There are people whose sex assigned at birth is assigned as intersex. What does that mean? Well, being intersex is one of two things. It either means that anatomically, a person is born with anatomy that correlates both to being male and female, and or there is a shift in DNA so that the DNA molecules are not fully considered XX or XY. In either of those situations, that individual is not medically considered male nor female, but the third category of intersex. So when we say, well, everybody's either a male or a female, that's actually not fully inclusive. Intersex is another category that is a medical assignment. Again, sex assigned at birth purely means two things, our body parts and our DNA. Where we start to get tripped up and make mistakes is when we make assumptions in any category other than the one we know. So if you happen to know that someone is a biological female, you don't know anything else about that person in any of the other categories. And again, that's where we've been socialized to make assumptions about all of these categories, and we can no longer do that. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we go up to the very top, gender identity. Now you'll see that that graphic looks different than the middle. The middle was three circled plot points, right? Male, female, intersex. That top gender identity is not plot points, but what is it? It's a scale. Do you notice how there's a long arrow? and see how that little bullet could go anywhere along that arrow. You'll also notice that the rainbow symbol next to gender identity, where does it go in the gender unicorn's body? It goes in the mind. Gender identity is something very personal to the way in which we authentically know ourself. So if I close my eyes and I think about what 
embodies Todd the most authentically as Todd relates to being a gendered person in society, I may have a lot of answers for you. I may say, I'm Todd, and I identify myself as a man. I might say, I'm Todd, and I identify myself as a woman. I might say, I'm Todd, and because these things are on scales, I think I'm a mixture in thereof. And maybe my numbers fluctuate. Maybe when I wake up this morning, I sort of feel like Todd today is 60% woman and 40% man. And maybe tomorrow, I'm gonna to be 80% man and 20% woman. And so I may use terms to describe me as a gendered being, like multi-gender or gender fluid. I may also get real deep with you and say, gender is a social construct, meaning we've just made this whole idea of gender up in order to try to understand the world. And yeah, I don't really buy that. So I may tell you I'm agender, meaning I don't know myself as a gendered person. All of these exist. All of these are authentic. Are we as familiar with every single one of those categories? Maybe not. Does that mean that the person who comes to our place of business, place of worship, storefront, line, whatever it might be, who says, hi, I'm Todd and I'm multi-gender. Does that mean that that experience for me is not fully authentic? No. So we have to be understanding that when people express or, or tell us something about themselves when it comes to their gender identity, we need to have an understanding of what that means. If we don't have an understanding of what that means, we in very respectful ways ask questions, right? Again, our understanding around things like gender identity in the last 10 years has become so expansive. And I, I will say, I appreciate when people have asked questions or have come up to me after a talk and said, Todd, I really am all about trying, and it just seems like every time I learn the acronym, or every time I learn a word, there's five different words now. And like it was LGBT, and then it was LGBTQ, and then it was LGBTQIA, now it's LGBTQIA2 plus X2, and I, I help, right? You're allowed to feel that way. And how wonderful that as a society, we just keep expanding and learning and someone is saying, you know, that acronym or that word or that definition, it's not quite yet me. So let's think about even widening how we understand that. So gender identity, how we authentically know ourselves. What gender identity does not correlate to is our sex assigned at birth. So just because Todd was born as a male does not mean that you can make any assumption that my gender identity is as a man. Does that make sense? We have to check ourselves. It's really hard, but we have to check ourselves. I'll tell you the next one that's really hard. We're going one down into our green zone, gender expression. So look at where that it exists on the gender unicorn. It's everywhere on the external. So we, again, are taught social rules about what it means and what is appropriate when expressing our gender. So for instance, one of the earlier examples I used, I won't lie to you, Todd enjoys a little retail therapy. When Todd's had a hard day, like Todd this week has talked about the coronavirus more than Todd would have ever liked to. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe I'm just gonna bop over to the Tanger outlets. Todd needs a new coronavirus outfit, I think. He has had a hard one. So when I go into a store, one of the clothing stores I enjoy shopping in, after I decide on the store I'm going to and I walk in the door, what is the next decision I am forced to make? So most of our stores are segregated. And if I'm going to this side, it means I'm shopping for whom? Women. And if I'm going to this side, it means I'm shopping for me. Men. And we have all of these understandings of who can wear these clothes and be seen as respectable in public, and who can wear these clothes and be respectable in public. 
Now what's fascinating about this is you can look at all sorts of ways as to how this is so subjective to our own time and our own experience. So for instance, we have a lot of culture and a lot of cultural groups in Hershey. How wonderful for us, right? That we are a thriving community made up of so many sub-communities. But culturally, not everybody believes the same things when it comes to dress. So you will see different cultures expressing themselves very differently than what those of us who grew up with Western, very European culture would. Also, how many of you have seen some fashion trends change over time? <laughs> right? I, I can tell you, I was talking to an organization in the Lancaster area where I live about these topics, and someone pulled me aside and said, this was amazing, and I'm not just bragging. They were like, oh, this was the best thing I've ever had. It was life-changing. Uh, no, they did, but they said, Todd, just to show you how far we've come, uh, in 1990, how many of us were alive in 1990? Lots of us. In 1990 was the first time we took out of our policy that people who identified as women had to wear skirts to work. In 1989, they would have said it would have been inappropriate for a woman to be seen in a place of business in a pant. Many of you, who I'm assuming may be women, are here in pants. I'm sure you didn't want to be disrespected on your choice of pant tonight, right? But it shows you how we can come to understand these things historically different over time. Another one of my favorite stories. Do you know why the high heel shoe was invented? To slow women down, whoever said that. <laughs> That's funny, because men were like, oh no, they're gonna run circles around us. <laughs> it was actually created for noble men. The first high heel shoe was created for noble men, and it served two purposes. The cobblers who created it, number one, said, how were noble men remembered through history at that time? We didn't have Twitter. So it was not on there, right? We didn't have Instagram filters to make us look good. It was through royal portrait. And so in order for men to look the most regal in portrait, right, if they could just get a little bit of height, their portrait, and you know, everything kind of slims out a little bit, and you're like, oh, look at my calves when I wear the shoes, right? And you looked much more regal because you were elevated. It also served a functional purpose. So if I'm the noble lord, my squire brings me my horse, I'm riding off into battle and everybody's cheering me on, I'm probably wearing some sort of hat, head, dress thing. I don't wanna have to pull my bridle down, everything's gonna dump off. So I can use my chunky heel and get my bridle and bring it to me and ride off. So the high heeled shoe was created as the utmost form of masculinity. What do we know the high yield shoe to be now? 360, the utmost form of femininity, right? But these ideas change over time. Yet in our minds, if we see someone come in in a high yield shoe and we're like, uh-oh, this doesn't work, this looks weird, right? We all of a sudden are programmed. And so it's everything from our clothing, if we choose to wear jewelry, body art, the ornament that we do, even our voice inflection. I've been totally misgendered on the phone at times, right? Because my voice may get a little bit higher, right? There are people who identify as women with much lower voices, but the minute that they get on the phone, it's like, hello, sir, how may I help you, right? So we make all of these assumptions based on all of this identity. And it's really hard not to, because I will tell you, for those of you like me who love networking, you go to things and meet people, so I'm at a cocktail party and I see someone I don't know and I say, oh God, I'm Todd, it's so nice to meet you. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, before that person has even responded, said their name, gave me any information, I have made assumptions about that person. Because I'm looking at that person and saying, oh, this is the color they're wearing. This is the length of their hair. Oh, they're wearing makeup. Oh, cute shoes. And I suddenly go, oh, I know everything about who this person is and how they identify themselves based fully on their clothing or their expression. And we cannot do that. 
right? Now you can say, I really love that person who wore that really cute cocktail dress. But the minute you say, who was that lady who wore that cocktail dress? Or I really love that woman that I just met in a cocktail dress. Unless that person has said, this is my gender identity, you do not know that is a woman. That is just a real cute person in a cocktail dress. Our final two connected but not joint sections at the bottom are about our attraction. And so we have separated out physical attraction and emotional attraction. And again, there is a scale of who and what types of people we are physically attracted to that we want to have a physical and or sexual relationship with and then those we are emotionally attracted to. Why do we separate them? Ideas? It may not be the same for every person. There may be people in our lives that we have physical attraction with that we don't have the same level of emotional attraction with. Vice versa. We have some people who say, I, am, I want to have connection with people. I want to have an emotional, a spiritual, a psychological bond with someone, but maybe I identify as asexual. Maybe I'm not looking for a physical relationship with someone. So again, we separate those so as not to leave anyone out of the spectrum of who we're talking about. The biggest takeaway from this, I think it's my next slide. Oh no, false alarm. The biggest takeaway from this is we cannot assume we all know what happens when we assume, right? But we cannot learn anything about someone and make assumptions about anything that we don't know, even though it has been human nature to do so. If I had to boil this down into a graphic, this is how, and I guarantee you, if me too, this is how we were taught to understand the world. We just assume someone's biological sex, they are male and female, and that means there will be a linear on the binary progression. So if I know somebody is male, that means they're gonna show up really masculine and that means they're gonna be attracted to women. And if I know somebody is female, that means they're gonna show up ultra feminine and they're gonna be attracted to men. So it was these two very linear maps. And what I'm telling you folk is that actually the world shows up a lot more like that. So if you'll notice one point, goes to every single other point. So someone might say, so Todd, what you're telling me is that someone could be a biological male and identify as a non-binary woman who is really fluid in expression and is attracted to both men and women and other. And I would say, yup. This is how the world is showing up. We may not uh, interface with it as much in Hershey, but some of us might, but I will tell you, this is how the world is showing up. And so we need to be understanding of the much more expansive nature of all of this than some of what we've understood up until this point. There, see, I knew that slot was out of place. So your one lesson, right? Before you assume, we're going to learn how to try this crazy method called asking. Now, I will tell you, right, we're going to ask appropriate questions when we're asking things of people, right? So we don't necessarily need to know their sexual orientation just because we're waiting on them at a Hershey business, right? Um, but there are ways in which we can start modeling this. If you saw on my first slide, it said that this is facilitated by someone named Todd Snobble, and the pronouns that I use are he, his, and him. When Lynette got up here, if you noticed, she said, hello, my name is Lynette, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. This is modeling how we start to help understand each other's gender identity, right? So when I send an email, in my email signature, it lists my pronouns. On my business card, it will have my pronouns. If the slide did not start that way, I would try to get up when I'm speaking to people I don't know and just quickly say, right? It takes me all of about two seconds. Hello, my name is Todd, and my pronouns are he, his, and him. Now, here's the problem. 
We're really good with he, and we're really good with she. We use those a lot. The problem is, think back to those fluid scales. Well, what are we gonna do with people who maybe say I'm gender fluid or I'm multi-gender? He or she may feel restrictive to them. And so some people may, that you will encounter, will say, hi, my name is Todd, and because I see my gender as much more fluid or expansive, my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. Singular they pronouns. Now, I will tell you, friends, I went to a liberal arts college and was an English major. So I like everything to so nicely be congruent, right? And so I'd be like, this is singular, and this is plural, and what do I do with that? And then I sort of had to get over that, because I'm like, wow, Todd, you're putting your own crap on somebody else, right? Get over it, like, I will figure it out. I'll be able to do it, and I'll tell you, I've been able to do it. And so the way that this would look, if it was being modeled, is if I was Todd and I used they, them, their pronouns, Again, you would leave and you would call someone tonight and say, I have just gone to the best cultural session, I, probably in 10 years that I've ever sat through. Um, and it was facilitated by this amazing person named Todd. And I just have to tell you, they knew so much about the content and they just went through it so efficiently. And I think you should get in contact with them to come to your organization. Singular, they, them, theirs pronouns. We also have folks, again, who maybe say I'm age gender, or maybe say mm -mm, there's a lot of, of social context with he or she, and I'm gonna use other non-gendered pronouns. And you can see there is a list of a multitude of pronouns that are being utilized. Are these happening as much? Not necessarily. Well, will we see them happening more? Yes. I have a student in Lancaster who uses the pronoun per. It is up there. If you are in a situation where somebody gives you a pronoun and you've not heard of it, the easiest thing to do is say, wow, that's new for me. May I ask you exactly how I use it so that I'm referring to you the correct way? Will we see this list stay the same in the next five years? Absolutely not. Who knows how much more expansive it will become? So what are some tips? How are we doing on time? I forgot to look. What time am I supposed to be done? 9.30? Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> I would say by 7.15. Yeah. Seven, oh, 7.15? Well, to take questions yeah. so people can be out by 7.30. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. we got plenty of time. Good. Okay. So what are some things that we can do, either on an organizational level, an individual level, any of these things? Well, one is we can learn. So I, I will tell you this. I love to be a resource to people. I really do. And so when people say, I have a question, I'm like, hit me. Let's do it. But like, the interesting thing for me is I'll sometimes have colleagues or, or folks in my life who call me and they say, Todd, I was listening to NPR and they talked about pansexuals. What is that? And I say, oh my gosh, well actually let me clue you into something you may just not know. There are these, these really, they're, they're magic boxes Mm -hmm. And on that magic box is this little rectangle, it's called the Google. And you can write pansexual in that box. And you actually get information on it. And maybe you could read a few of the things that come up, and then if you still have questions, we could talk. Right? What a, what a novel idea. We, are, we, it, we live in an amazing time, friends. We have more information at a second at our fingertips than ever before. So sometimes we need to take it upon ourselves to learn. So if you're in a situation and you're like, oh, that, mm -mm, don't know that word, right? Write it down and look it up. And then if you have questions, find the experts, right? But we can empower ourselves to do a lot of that learning. It's also a great way to find resources, right? So I tell everybody everywhere, right? The work that Penn State Hershey and the College of Medicine are doing around gender-affirming care is making them a national leader in these things. In our backyard, I was amazed and so honored when I was working at the governor's, uh, with the governor's office, I got to go and serve on a testimony panel at the National Institute of Health with Dr. Katie Dalk from Penn State, 
who is one of the leading researchers and physicians around intersex identity in Hershey, working with us as our neighbor. So we are so blessed by some of the resources that we have. And again, I know that some of our major employers here in Hershey are, are really centering diversity in the work that they're doing. And some of them have amazing individuals who are hired by those companies to center diversity and diverse populations. And so there are a lot of resources, not just on our phones, but within our communities, and we can be finding them. Um, sometimes for our organizations, or again, just for us as people, it can be a lot about monitoring our language. And it's not just about pronouns, even though that's a biggie, it's just all of the things that we do or say that we don't even think about, but that serve a message and send cultural signals. So I come from education. I don't typically teach younger children, right? But how many of our teachers say, you know, I'm going to send this permission slip home and make sure mom or dad sign that. How many times do I get people's attention in a room by saying, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. Well, all, you know, I don't necessarily mean anything, right? I'm not trying to single anybody out. But if there's the second lesson that you leave here with, it is to always remember the difference between intent and impact. So oftentimes when people run into roadblocks around these issues, it's not that most of us had an intent to harm someone, to disrespect someone, to belittle them, but the impact that has been felt by what we said or what we did may be very different. So when I get the room going by saying, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and someone in that room doesn't identify with the term lady or gentleman, they essentially no longer feel part of this community. If they go somewhere and they have had the wrong pronoun used time and time again, and every time they have to take it upon themselves to say, I, I'm sorry, that's actually not the pronoun. I'm sorry, you're actually, you, can I just interrupt you? That's the wrong pronoun, right? At some point they might just say, yeah, this is not the place for me. So intent versus impact. And sometimes those slips of language are so easy for us and we don't think about it but the impact may be much greater than what we expect. Promoting awareness and educating. And I don't just mean you work for a big company and you're going to have an educational you know, event. I mean, whatever you do tomorrow, whether you've gone to the grocery store to look for any hand sanitizer that still exists in the world, <laughs> whether you have mahjong tomorrow, whether you're on the golf course, and somebody brings something up and you say, hey, you know, I went to this event last night. Do you ever think about these things? That's education. When somebody uses humor that mm, actually kind of jabs a little bit at a specific group, and you say, do you actually think about what you're saying when you say that? That's educating, right? We can all take it upon ourselves to be agents of awareness and education. For those of us in more structured organizations, I do say it's great, audit your operation. So again, you, uh, you, can, you can hire me, I'll be your consultant, I'll come in and audit your operation, but you don't need me, because you can do it on your own. Great examples. I had one organization call me and say, we're, we're racking our brains, Todd, because our, can we have a dress code? I said, of course you can have a dress code. You're a private company. You can put any expectations on your workforce that you want. And they're like, okay, well, here's what our dress code says. It says, you know, men can wear collared shirts or polos and khakis or black or blue pants, and women can wear pants or dresses at this length or skirts. So how do we do this? I'm like, okay, all right, let's think about this. I'm like, how about we say this? Employees of your company can wear polos or shirts or pants or skirts or dresses. Like, well, what, what, just like that? I'm like, yeah, it's all the same stuff, right? I'm just not saying who's okay to wear those things. So as long as the dress is the right length, it doesn't matter who's wearing it. And you have an inclusive dress code, right? And they're like, oh, wow. So again, auditing our operations to just look at where do these things eke into um, 
eke into our, our culture and or our policy. Um, you know, I'll tell you, when I worked at the state, uh, I, I loved serving uh, with one of my colleagues who was uh, running PennDOT, the Department of Transportation, as the first female secretary of PennDOT. And when Secretary Richards came in, one of the things that she actually found sort of laughable was they gave her a manual and said, like, here's how the, here's the functioning handbook of the department. And every single thing said, when the secretary is appointed by the governor, he will then do this, at which point he will then elect these people, at which point he will then do this, right? Some of our policies may say, when a employee submits this form, he or she will then go and do this. What is the problem in all of those things? Well, we are putting gender assumptions in every single one of those examples. The gender assumption was that every Department of Transportation secretary would be a man using he pronouns. The other assumption is, while we're trying to be inclusive and say, well, it's he or she, we have employees that don't use he or she pronouns. And so anywhere that we can catch those and say, how do we de-gender that? It's really easy. You say, when the employee submits this form, the employee will then do this, at which time the employee will hear this response. I just rewrote it, but now I've taken gender completely out of it, and it's inclusive for everybody. And the last thing I will say is, it is okay to celebrate. Now, obviously, do this with respect to the people that you are celebrating. But if someone says to you as a community organization, as a business here in Hershey, even as an individual, I want to let you know, I feel so respected and valued by you, and that is not what I typically get. Celebrate that moment, because you are giving that person something and I, I do not mean to sound elevated when I say this, but you are giving that person something in that moment that you do not know could have been life-saving. Because for some people who go through, you know, we are all very busy people, would anyone argue that? So imagine just trying to go to school or go to work or get everything done, and you are constantly thinking about how you show up in the world every second because other people are forcing you to think about that. It's exhausting. And for some members of our community, it has been time and time and time and time again. And maybe this was the last time that they're like, if it happens this time, I'm giving up, I'm done. And for someone to say, hey, I don't know you. Can I ask your name and pronouns? Or for someone to do anything else that helps say, hey, we're welcoming. We are great with who you are, come right on in. That could, in that moment, be like, all right, I'm giving it one more week. I'm giving it one more month, or all right, I'm in it. I'm in it to win it. So please celebrate if you are ever aware, if someone is respectful enough to share with you that the things you're doing are really, really helpful. So just some language tips. Um, and I said I would break down language. So uh, when we talk about sexual identities or sexual orientations, right, when we talk about non-heterosexual sexual orientations, we will have people in our communities, notice I use plural there, because we are many communities that make up one big umbrella, but we will have people who identify themselves as gay, we have people that identify themselves as lesbians, as bisexuals, as pansexuals, as demisexuals. You will also see Q, right? We, I use LGBTQ in the acronym that I most often use. And Q stands for a holistic look at the queer community. Now I know for some of us, we may hear that word and say, ooh, right? We may have this kind of visceral reaction. Because that word, depending on you know, our, our age and our life experience, has had negative impact in the past. Imagine the idea of reclaiming the power of that word. And so queer has become the mothered umbrella for everyone that fits within our community. So you will hear people identify themselves as queer 
or they may talk about being a member of the queer community. You may hear about queer theory or queer research. Again, the idea of trying to be as holistic as possible to envelope everyone who fits within our identity populations. When it comes to gender identity, right, we have talked about, you can identify as a man, you can identify as a woman, you can identify as uh, gender fluid, gender queer, you might hear. We also think about that binary way of thinking. And so if you remember that very first map, if we are someone who is biologically male and we identify as a man, and in identifying as a man, we tend to show up in mostly masculine ways, we are on a binary spectrum and we are known as being cisgender, C-I-S gender. Same thing if we are a biological female, we identify as a woman, and in that woman-ness, we tend to be mostly feminine, right? We are cisgender. When someone does not societally congruently fall in that nice frame, meaning they are a biological male, but they may identify as a woman, or they may identify as something other than a man, we use the term transgender to describe them. Now, you'll notice, you might think it's picky, but it's not. We don't talk about someone being transgendered. We also don't talk about a group of transgenders. You can say a transgender person. You can also uh, shorten it. Most of our populations are okay with the shortened version of trans. I prefer a person who is transgender. Why? Because the emphasis is they are a person. And this happens to be something about them. I could argue, well, why don't we go around telling everybody that we're cisgender, for those of us in the room who are cisgender, and I would tell you because we don't have to. Because everybody will assume already that we are cisgender. Right? So I love a person who is transgender. Trans is also fine. Tranny, not good. Negative, very hateful connotation to that. So that is not a word you want to use. Um, also, you may have heard, right, sort of the classic outdated language is when people would say, oh, someone's having a sex change operation. We've moved away from that. The best way that people can, can um, bring those phrases up is either with gender confirmation or gender affirmation surgeries. But here's the thing. If you are encountering someone who says, you know, I'm just letting you know that my name's Todd and I'm transgender, you cannot assume anything about surgery, that I've had surgery, that I will be having surgery, or that surgery has anything to do with my current status. Why do I say that? Well, for some transgender people, they do not need a surgical procedure in order to feel whole within their trans nature and trans body. For others, think about any one of us who has gone through any type of surgery. One, surgeries are very evasive. They take a lot of prep time, they take a lot of recovery time, and for those of us who are still working, do we have the insurance that's covering those procedures? Do we have the employer that says, sure, take three weeks of recovery time. No problem, I'll keep paying you. We don't all have that luxury. Also, if you are unaware in Pennsylvania, some evasive surgeries are only happening in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. So imagine telling that person in Erie, sure, you can have a gender affirmation surgery, but you're getting to Philadelphia for every pre-op appointment, post-op appointment, the surgery itself. For a lot of you know, our community, there are many roadblocks to why surgery, even if they desire it, may never be a part of their narrative. So we can't just assume if someone says, hi, I'm a transgender person, or I'm a person who's transgender, that they will ever necessarily have surgery. Uh, other things over here, gender non-conforming. So again, that idea that I might just throw out all of these rules you all have with dress, and so maybe today I'm in a three-piece suit, and tomorrow I'm in a cocktail dress. And it might confuse you, and great, because that's what I was hoping for anyway. Right? Uh, and again, non-binary gender queer, this idea of blurring this spectrum, right? So people will identify using all of these terms. 
So what happens when we make a mistake, and quite frankly, not if we make a mistake, when we make a mistake, because we are human. I will tell you, members of our own communities make mistakes, right? Not, I tell this to people all the time, we have enough, we have as much to unpack around supporting our communities as all of our cis and heterosexual partners do. Because not every G is good with every T, not every L is good with every B. We's got works to do. So, uh, what happens when we make a mistake, and we will, you may hear the term used called a microaggression. Uh, again, this is a term that started in the 80s, since then has just had leaps and leaps and leaps of um, background and research. So essentially, what is a microaggression? So whether intentional or unintentional, it is a verbal, a nonverbal, a behavioral, or an environmental indignity or disrespect. So again, notice verbal and nonverbal. So I would talk to a lot of people uh, in the state who says, yeah, we have policies on paper that says people can't you know, directly target me based on any of these statuses, but yet everybody in my office goes to lunch on Wednesday and I've never been invited. I know that the person next to me is putting me on Snapchat videos and what am I supposed to do about that? So we have all, it's not always just what we're saying overtly, right? There are, there's a lot of messages, right, that come out. Uh, you know, the other thing is we make a lot of assumptions based on iconically how we've seen queer people show up, mostly in Hollywood. So I do have a theater background, so I love talking about theater, but I can't tell you the amount of people that are like, do you love show tunes? And I'm like, so I do, but not every gay man does. This just in. Some gay men love rock and roll. I'm shocking, I know, right? Or I dealt with a situation where a woman who happened to be a lesbian was having a job interview. A employer was trying to be like, look, I'm affirming, I'm friendly, and was like, Melissa Etheridge, do you just love her? And this woman was like, nope, no. That's, that, what a question, right? So again, intent is like, I'm gonna show how great I am. Impact is, wow, you think every stereotypical lesbian likes Melissa Etheridge. I was joking with this, with this woman after I said, I would have been like, yeah, do you need your oil changed in your truck? I'm happy to just roll up the sleeves and go out there and do that, right? So, but you know, we can find sometimes humor in these things, but again, for some people, just like always assuming stereotypical qualities is a microaggression. And it can happen lots of times around sex and gender. So those subtle negative attitudes that convey one sexual preference, one sexual orientation, or gender identity is less valuable. So we're gonna do some quick scenarios, and I know we're a big group, but I know that some people will call out some really great suggestions. So real life scenarios. You are sitting with a group of your team members at lunch, and one says, oh, that new payroll system, it is just so gay. What do you do? Do you just keep eating? What do you do? Oh, I'm sorry, I said I wouldn't move. <laughs> Poor Susan. <laughs> just be like, oh, that wasn't really nice. You politely try to correct them and say that's not how we would use that word. So maybe you're gonna ask some questions like, tell me what you mean by that. So if we remove gay, like if it was an ad lib and we were like, we need an adjective that means that same thing in that sentence, what could we put in its place? What are we saying gay is synonymous to? That system is so Bad, frustrating, annoying, stupid, wrong. Those are not synonyms to gay. I work at colleges. A lot of our students still say things like this. They will even say them to me because they're not thinking about it, right? Again, impact and intent. But when a student would come in and be like, I just took an exam, it was so gay. I would typically say, I am so happy that that exam took time to confide in you the other types of exams that it is sexually attracted to. <laughs> <laughs> what a breakthrough. I am, thank you for being there for that exam. And then they'd be like, oh, Todd, I'm sorry, you know what I meant. And I'm like, yeah, 
but what you said is not what you meant. So I know it's, it's real easy for me to stand up here and say that, but the problem becomes if we all just sit and let it happen, we become complacent in it. And even if it's not affecting us personally, you don't know that the new coworker sitting right there isn't a member of the community or has a sibling or a loved one who, or a child who is a member of the community and is taking that very much to heart to say, wow, not only was this said, but no one else thought anything to say against it. So remember back to the first slide, guess what your culture is known as now to that person, right? So some great ways to kind of deflect or say like, let's think about our language there. A colleague comes to you, I promise I'm closing right now. A colleague comes to you and tells you that that new person that we hired is supposedly a lesbian. And you have to say it with hushed tones. What do you do? So, and, great. Maybe you wanna be like, are you interested? Like, want me to set you up? <laughs> so, diminish that that has any rumor to it and just be like, okay, I'm gonna keep working now. Final one. Two team members are talking about their nervousness. There is a client who's just walked up to the desk and we don't know if it's a guy or a girl. So none of us want to wait on that person. What do you do? So maybe you don't actually need to know to get the transaction done. If for some reason you do, what do you do? Hi, nice to meet you. I'm gonna be waiting on you. My name is Todd and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Can I ask you your name and pronouns? That easy. All right, and finally, before we go into questions, so how are communities thinking about this? Uh, this is a place in Pennsylvania, Lansdale, Pennsylvania, Montgomery County, uh, doing a drag queen story hour. They said, oh my gosh, we shouldn't do this. People are gonna write letters and nobody will come. And I said, yeah, maybe we should do this. And the room was packed. How are states thinking about this? I will quickly tell you that unfortunately, Pennsylvania still does not have comprehensive non-discrimination, meaning it is not I repeat, not illegal for a business to say, ooh, you put up a picture of you and your same-sex partner, you're gonna need to pack up and I'm terminating you. That is not illegal. We have a lot of work to do in the state. And what can you do? You can be an ally. And how do you know if you're doing this on a daily basis? I've come up with a little checklist. <laughs> so if you at the end of the night, as you're laying your head on a pillow, can say, I did not walk around assuming everybody is hetero, cis, and gender conforming. I tried to use the most inclusive language I could. I found ways to educate others on these issues. I interrupted prejudice when somebody used that joke. I said, not here. I don't act nervous or uncomfortable or angry if somebody brings up their gender identity, expression, or sexuality. I respect confidentiality. So if I'm the person who knows that, it's not for me to tell anybody else. And finally, I know where and when to seek and refer resources if somebody asks me. And friends, if you can do these things, I ensure you that the messaging I'm gonna hear from every member of the queer community is let's keep going to Hershey because it's a great experience. And at the end of the day, that's what we all want. So we're gonna open it up to some questions. I would love to engage with you. I'm gonna turn off my mic momentarily so that we can have the um, mics with the questions come through. Many times, waitresses at places will come to the table and say, are you guys ready to order? Yeah. Yeah. Wife and husband sitting there, we're not those guys. You respond. What would you, in order to educate the waitress, what would be a polite way of saying, we're not guys? My, oh, yeah, there we go. So that's a wonderful uh, example and question. So just in case everybody heard it, we will often use guys 
as a reference even to a multi-gendered group of people. Like, hey, you guys, it was great to see you all. Even though guys is gendered language, um, and it's a great way to check ourselves. The easiest way is to say, are you all, or are you ready to order to eliminate any gendered language out of that? I would say the other example that sometimes comes up is, is how we try to show respect to people. And so a lot of people in hospitality are trained to say things like sir and ma'am, and it is meant to be a sign of respect. Uh, the problem is we have to know who wants to be referred to as sir or ma'am. And so these are all great examples where we use gender, where we use an assumption on someone. So anywhere that we can open it up, are you ready? How may I help you? Versus, hello ma'am, are you guys ready? Right? Well that just messed it all up in many ways. So excellent examples to how we can look to de-gender our language. You have spoken about uh, some of the problems that we don't have in Hershey, but the problem that we do have in Hershey, the Hershey area anyhow, is that uh, we have holy books that say, if you're a woman and you wear pants, you are an abomination and you should be stoned to death. So how do you deal with that situation? So, there we go. So thank you for that. Um, question is, I'll paraphrase sort of around how do we deal with how, again, some of these ideas are internalized into communities, religious and spiritual, and communities of faith included. Uh, and obviously, these are areas with a lot of disagreement in faith communities. And in very, you know, in my opinion, very sad ways in some faith communities are literally almost ripping them apart. Um, and so what I would say is, you know, we try to always engage in dialogue with faith communities. We have a lot of LGBTQ people who are also people of faith. Um, so when some of our faith communities say, well, those two things can't be congruent, we say, well, actually, yes, they can, right? And so what we would tell LGBTQ people of faith um, is to, you know, really sort of do some of that cultural homework when it comes to places of faith. Again, think about where we find message and culture. So in this day and age, we can do a lot of work looking at websites, at images on social media that faith-based groups put out, and oftentimes talking to our own communities and to where they have had positive and welcoming experience in faith backgrounds. I will also say, last summer, I almost killed myself trying to get to every Pride Festival across Pennsylvania. In about eight weekends, I would not recommend it. Go to the ones near you, that's fine. Um, but in every single one, including parts of rural Pennsylvania, I was so incredibly touched to see how many faith communities made an effort to be there, to have a physical presence, and for faith and lay leaders to say, please think about our congregation because you are welcome here. So we do realize and acknowledge it's not every faith community that's inclusive, but I think it's wonderful to see the progress that each day new areas of thinking are getting more to that place. So uh, you brought up something earlier that made me think about another organization or community uh, who associates um, sir and ma'am, and that's uh, the military. And so this is a, an organization that's been around for hundreds of years, and this is sort of providing sense to the culture and how they do things. And um, as a spouse of a military member, I, you know, I, I, I'm exposed to this quite a bit, but uh, I also know that the community's been changing and there's been sort of some flip-flops back and forth. Um, but when it comes down to things, there are some concerns about in times of peril or war or whatever you want to call it, when, when women need to make certain decisions that there are concerns about um, high emotions or people having issues about, like you're saying, identifying one or the other. And um, so how should they address the situation? 
situations or what can they do to help this Yeah, so some great questions, um, specifically sort of looking at how are we looking at these issues, um, especially with LGBTQ people in military service. Uh, and so if, if you are of the belief that like, well, we, we eradicated Don't Ask, Don't Tell, so there are no problems in the military, I can tell you that that's not true. Uh, there are still plenty of cultural beliefs that happen in the military. Um, the military is also interesting because to some aspects there are things that states can do um, with, for instance, their own sort of reserves, and then there are things that lay on choices of the federal government. Uh, by no means is this a talk about anything partisan, um, but I would say always do your research about choices that federal politicians and governments are making. Right now, there are still bans on members of our community that are told they are not worthy of serving in the military. Uh, none of which has been corroborated or backed up by any medical research to prove that any of those thoughts are valid. Um, so we have a lot of work to do within the military, not just access to the military, but sort of the, the gendered culture that lives within it. I will just share one story. Um, we have a Department of Military and Veterans Affairs in Pennsylvania, and they, when I was with the governor's office, were incredible to work with. Um, both in some of the ways that we were marketing um, Pennsylvania military service, but also one of the things that they do is oversight of all of the veterans' homes across Pennsylvania. And so our Military and Veterans Affairs Department of Pennsylvania is the only state who has invested in getting every veteran's home across Pennsylvania SAGE certified. And SAGE is a national organization that works with LGBTQ elders and does competency and awareness training for um, uh, care workers in uh, retirement and elder communities. And so we are thrilled at the steps that are being taken to, to start to chip away at some of those understandings in the military here in Pennsylvania. But there is a lot of work that we need to keep raising our voice to that needs to be done on a national scale. Thank you. So coming from my work at Hershey Entertainment, I know that I have to have hundreds if not thousands of joy interactions with guests every single day, and where I often use the terms uh, sir or ma'am. And coming from a young age, do not use those terms and often be regarded as disrespectful. So my question is, what would you recommend as an alternative to those terms that's not gender specific, but also not going to lead me as being the disrespectful? Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing that, um, right? We, <laughs> I talk a lot about intersection, right? And age is one of those intersections that obviously can compound the way that we do work. And so some of us are in high yield, very high turnover with a lot of clients or customers. The most inclusive way um, is to recognize a person without a salutation or an honorific, right? No sir, ma'am, no Mr., Ms., anything like that, but also understanding that there are some then cultural interpretations of that. And so um, what I would say is, I would encourage this to be like a thoughtful policy that your leadership, you kind of lead the charge to say, we should really think about this. Um, how should we be addressing our clients that can be respectful, but also not accidentally disrespect someone because of an assumption that we made? And how often do we use this as a lens of education? And so, for instance, if someone writes in or calls in and says, you know, I prefer to be called sir and no one addressed me that way, um, that's a great way of educating that person to say, thank you so much for letting us know that. By no means were we meaning to be disrespectful, our policy is actually to try to not use those words unless someone does tell us this um, to make sure that we're inclusive to everyone. But I totally acknowledge that sometimes in those spaces, um, not everybody is used to not hearing that. And so the beauty of this is that we're hoping we continue to shift culture. Um, it's the, the same sort of way, um, formal invitations. A lot of organizations are getting rid of using those honorifics like Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. and are just putting names. 
That is sometimes getting mixed reviews too, but again, cultural changes sometimes take some time. So I totally understand how that can be challenging sometimes. Well, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, appreciate your stories. This is the best diversity training I've ever gone to. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Y'all should tweet that. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have dessert in the lobby and appreciate you coming. Thanks, everybody.